So suppose you want to calculate the greatest common divisors of two integers, say 10 and 32, GCD is two. You can encode the 10 and 32 and two as sequences of digits. So, you know, plus one, O, plus three, two, plus two. And you would train the transformer to learn to translate plus one, O, plus three, two into plus two. I want to do this just from examples. So the machine doesn't learn any mathematics as a pure language problem. Uh, to go further, you know, when I say 10 is plus one zero, you have to think that I'm I'm writing one as one just for convenience for us. But for the transformer, there's no words. The words have no meaning. They're just symbols. They're just indexed in some kind of vocabulary table. So I could replace all those words and say it's banana plum apple, banana something, something, etc. I could change all the words into other words. It wouldn't mean change anything for the model. So the funny thing is that this works. So I've been doing that for a couple of years. So we've been able to the first, you know, work on this was we, with Guillaume Lample um, a couple of years ago, where we showed you could do symbolic integration. So you give a function and you find the integral, the symbolic integral. And we could do it pretty much as well, a little better than Mathematica or Maple, so as well as computer algebras. We've been doing that on dynamical system, so finding the properties of dynamical system with uh, Amore Ayat. So I'll show you examples on linear algebra. Um, you can also apply this to symbolic regression, and more recently I've been using it to do cryptanalysis, so attack modern schemes of cryptography, learning with errors, so post-quantum cryptography with these kinds of tools. So before starting, I'd like to, you might wonder why do this. So there's a shallow reason for doing this, which is, you know, it's a challenge like Go, like chess. It's the kind of thing, say, when computers can do mathematics, Go, chess, etc., they will be intelligent. And of course, one day it might happen, and, and it won't happen that we will say the machines are intelligent. It didn't happen for Go or chess. But like Go, like chess, on the way, we will learn a couple of things about AI and transformers. It's interesting in its own right because it's a good problem for machines. More importantly, it's important because many people now are wanting to do AI for science, basically use AI to help scientists discover new science. And the thing is that science, at least exact science, are really full of math. So if you cannot do math, there's no chance your transformer can do science. So it's an important prerequisite, if you will, for AI for science. And finally, there's a couple of practical application. I mentioned cryptography. I'll show an application, a possible application in theoretical physics in, in just a while. So what's the program? When you want to solve, you know, solve a problem of math, with transformer, you're going to do need to do three things. First, you need to represent the problems and the solution as sequences in some language that the model can translate. Second, you're going to need to generate large sets of problems and solution to train the machine. And finally, you're going to train the, the model to translate. This is the easiest part, in fact. So how do you represent problems and solution as sequences? Well, you know, most mathematical objects are already symbols or are in sequential form. So many, we, you know, we use lots of letters and symbols like pi in, in math. Many mathematical objects like vectors, matrices are already essentially sequences or sequences of sequences. You can think of a graph as a sequence of edge, which are pairs of nodes, sequences of sequences. You know, it's, it's relatively easy to do. There are only two issues. How do you represent numbers? And how do you represent expressions like functions, equations, all that? So for numbers, so long you consider only integers, you can represent them as we write them, as sequences of digits preceded by sign in some base. So 1024 in base 10 could be written as five words plus 1024. If you think it's too long, then you, you just get a higher base. Base 100 will be plus 1024, and you can select any base. Once you know how to do integers, you know how to do uh, rationals, that just pass, so sequences of integers. The difficulty comes with real numbers. So real numbers, some of them are symbols or expressions, you know, pi, square root three plus two, they are expression derived from integers, so you could turn them into sentences. But most real numbers, you will not be able to enumerate all the digits, there are way too many of them. So basically you do as you do in computer science, you encode them as floating point numbers. So I usually use base 10, so three tokens, a sign, a mantissa, an exponent. 
And once you do that, so you're in for approximate calculation, not exact calculation here. Um, but once you know how to do real numbers, you can do complex numbers, etc. cetera. Uh, the point is, how do you represent an expression? So it's a very old trick in math. If you've done uh, formal logic, you probably know that. Any expression can be represented as a tree. You know, this dates back from the 30s in, in logic. Uh, it's used also in computer science. They call it abstract syntax tree. So basically, you can represent an expression as a tree where the operators are the internal nodes of the tree and the leaves of the tree are the base symbols. So integers, maybe variables. So you see on the left, two plus three times five plus two, you have plus times and plus as internal leaves and two, three, five, two as uh, leaves, uh, as internal nodes and leaves. And you, you even can do it with the parenthesis because the tree takes care of the order of calculation. And just by extending this very simple formulation, you know, adding new, new elements, new tokens, uh, you can get a function like the middle one, or if you're a little more fancy and add, you know, Greek letters and operators for differential operators, et cetera, you can encode um, the, the rightmost expression, which is the, the one dimensional wave function. So you can represent a lot of mathematical objects this way. The good thing is that once you have an expression, it's very easy to, once you have a tree, it's very easy to enumerate it into a sequence. So we typically use Polish notation. So you, you represent a tree by enumerating from the root, left parent before child and left before right. So here, you know, start from the root. So plus left parent two, right, right, right child, start from the root time three plus five, two, et cetera. And, and this is done. Once you've done that, you can encode pretty much any mathematical object into a short or sometimes long sequence of tokens. So we are ready for the transformer. Second step is generating data. So there are two approaches to generating data. The classical way, you want to generate from problems and solutions. So you generate random problems and you compute the solutions. And this gives you a pair, problem and solution, that you can add to your training set, rinse, repeat 10 million times, and there you go. The problem is that this only works if you know how to solve the problem and if you have a solver. For any open problem, you're going to need to go the other way. I call it the backward way where instead of finding the solution to a problem, you're going to find the problem to a solution. So you generate a, a solution and you try in a way to derive a problem that, solve, that is solved by, by the solution you have generated. It turns out this works most of the time. And, and so you can, the, the number of problems you can work on is relatively large. Finally, when, once you have generated your data, you train the model on generated data. This is supervised learning because you have the problem and solution. You do it exactly like you would do uh, language models. So you train by minimizing cross entropy, which means that no mathematical knowledge is needed for, from the model at train time. Okay, the model just predicts the next token. It could be anything and it gets rewarded if the next token is right and penalized if the next token is wrong. And then at test time, of course, you test it on held out data. So data you haven't seen at training and you check it with an external tool, uh, which checks, you know, some kind of mathematical value of the solution predicted by the transformer. So this only applies to cases where you can verify the solution. If there's no easy way to verify a solution, even approximately, um, then this method won't apply. Okay, so uh, let me now present a couple of applications. So the first thing I'd like to present was a, a paper from last year with Stéphane Dascoli, uh, where we sort of attacked, so it's called symbolic regression. Practically, we we wanted to, to focus on something that looks a lot like IQ test. You know, the, the typical IQ test, I give you a sequence of integer and you're supposed to predict the next one. So I give you one, two, four, seven, 11, 16, what's the next one? And there are basically two approaches, the statistical approach, which usually called numeric regression, that's where regression got its name, which is direct prediction of the next term. So you, you look very hard at the numbers, you apply different formulas, you know, moving averages, autoregressive model, that kind of things, and you predict numbers from numbers. But this is not the way we do it. So we humans, when we do this, usually use symbolic regression. We find a formula that accounts for the sequence, 1, 2, 4, 7, 11, 16. We predict this formula, and we might find a closed formula or 
more likely a recurrence relation. If you try to solve this problem when I was talking, shame on you. Uh, this would be, you would probably have found this one. And you find this recurrence relation and predict the next term. And when you think of it, this is not a very efficient procedure. You know, by finding a formula, you, you're solving a much more difficult an induction problem, a more, more abstract problem than the one you could solve by going just from number to number. But that's the way we do it. So we train, we consider two cases, integer and real sequence, integer because they're the IQ test thing, real because they have a little more physical sense. And we want to compare transformer that do numeric regression and symbolic regression on that and see you know, if it works and how it works. So how do you do it? You generate the data. So this needs to be backward. We don't have a solution for that. So we generate the solution, a random function. So n plus un minus one in our case. We sample initial points. So it's a first order formula. So we need one sample point. So we say we start at one. We then can use the function to compute a fairly long sequence. And then we have two problems for two different models. In the symbolic regression problem, we give the model, say, the five first values, and it's supposed to return n plus u, n plus one. And in the numeric regression, we give it the five first numbers, and it's supposed to predict the next or the five next numbers in the sequence. To generate a random formula, how do you do this? Well, you know, formulas are trees. So instead of re generating random formulas, you can generate a random tree. And once you generate a random tree, you can decorate it, if you will, by sampling you know, operators as nodes and integers or past terms or n as leaves. And then you get a sequence. So if you're solving it on integers, if you, you focus on integer sequence, the operators need to be closed on the integer, integer domain. So you can use you know, the four operation with integer, multi, integer division with modulus, something like that. If you use floating point numbers, then you have more operators. You can work with, you know, sine, cosine, etc. So two different families of functions. And to evaluate the model, so I said you need to test the model. How do you evaluate this kind of model? Well, it's simple. You cannot evaluate the quality of a function because there are many functions that would serve as the correct solution. So you just evaluate the the the, the solution, the, the function by the way it predicts. So you predict the next 10 terms on the next five terms of the sequence, and you want all the terms to be correct. You don't want an average. You know, if the model is right the three first term and they get totally wrong the next two, it's not good. So basically you have kind of an, an infinite um, distance that you can use at test time. And you evaluate on, uh, in this case, 10,000 held out samples. So held out means samples you haven't seen at training, because if you've yeah, if you test on the samples you trained on, you're in sort of a state of sin, if you like. It's uh, it's not, yeah, it's not a way to do things. So the results for this, and they're interesting, that's the, the top table. You can see we have two cases, the case of integer sequence and float sequences, and two models, the symbolic model that predicts a function and the numeric model that directly predicts the value. And you can see that the symbolic model always outperforms the numeric model. So. The best way for the machine to do this is to do like humans, try to find a function and then use it to predict more than predicting directly. And again, this is counterintuitive because you would expect that direct prediction of the number would be an easier problem, but it's it's not the case apparently here. You can see that on, so the number of operators mean the complexity of the formula. You can see that the best result, 92% correct prediction on the test set are achieved for in the integer case, the float case is more difficult, but this is due to the fact that the float problem space is larger. You remember we have more functions, so there are more many curves that can be done, but still the result is interesting. The limitation of this kind of result is that this is in domain, so we're testing on the same functions or the same family of function that the one we have used for training. In real life, whatever real life would be in this case, uh, this wouldn't be so, yeah, I mean, you would get data, the, the data you use for testing or for using the model is not generated like your training set. So we have a, a way to test it out of domain. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I want to show you a couple of success and failure cases. So on the left, you have successes. On the right, you have failure cases. Uh, I'm showing that the green part is the part the model the, the data that was given to the model and the blue part is the part that the model, the part of the sequence, the model predicts. You can see that it's it's sort of random. So you've got 
simple or relatively simple curves that are well predicted, but complicated curves that are also well predicted. And you have simple curves that are badly predicted and complicated curves also. You can see that there's no typical pattern for failure. You have failures that fail just because of one or two points, and you can not really even tell by looking at that. It's a very small change. You have things where the machine is totally wrong. You know, it's correct on the on the green part and totally wrong on the blue part, and places where the machine totally loses it and, and nothing is right, you know, anywhere. So, yeah. So I said we were in domain. We want to test, you know, on general data. And in this case, we have a nice external baseline, which is something called the OEOIS, the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequence, which is a huge collection of integer sequence, not all of them recurrent, not all of them mathematical. For instance, you have, yeah, you have very weird sequences there. Um, but uh, we could test it. And if you train the model, if you test the model on it, so the model is trained on generated sequence, but tested there, you can see that uh, performance go down, and this is logical because we no longer we train on it on recurrent sequences, but we're not testing on it. So some of the sequence don't even have a recurrence that the model could find. Um, but we have um, we still have thirty three percent of of those sequences predicted correctly by the symbolic model. It's interesting to know to notice also that the numeric model now performs better than the symbolic model. Why? Because the numeric model is sort of more versatile because, you know, the symbolic model can only predict uh, a recurrence. And if your sequence is not a recurrence, there's no chance it will work or not approximable by, by a recurrence. It will not work. But the numeric model can adapt to anything. So that's, yeah, that's a good thing for the numeric model. Um, the two last lines are what Mathematica can do on those problems. So there are two functions in Mathematica to find those kinds of recurrent sequences. And you can see that uh, a transformer really outperforms uh, what can be said state of the art, at least in, in computer algebra systems. Paul, um, can you just yep. go over what the constants are there? I don't understand n input, n pred, n pred, et cetera. Oh, so, yeah. N input is the number of data, you, the number of, of, uh, of values of, of elements in the sequence that you give the model. And n pred is the number of predictions you take, you 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 measure in the evaluation. So, if an input is fifteen, I'm taking the fifteen first terms of the sequence in OEIS as the input to my trained model, and I want the model to be tested on predicting the next or the ten next ones. So you can see that. So what's interesting is that that's a good question. You can see that the model doesn't really care. Well, the transformer doesn't really care about seeing 15 or 25 inputs. You see, you go from 33 to 34, 53 to 54. It doesn't change a lot. Mathematica suffers a lot. At least the, the first one suffers a lot from, you know, the size of the N input. It goes down. For the finally near recurrence, I don't know why the last one goes up. It's, um, you know, it, go, it goes down in one case, up in the other case, but it has an impact. For us, it has little impact. The number of elements you predict, of course, if you predict 10 elements, called and if you just predict one for the model, but it's not, uh, so you got a drop in performance, but it doesn't go to zero. I mean, you, you don't lose everything when you, when you predict incorrectly. You go from 33 to only 20, so one third to one fifth or something like that. So that's, yeah, the main conclusion. So these are sequences. And I'd like to, to show a couple of things to, to open on the rest of my presentation. So the models is limited to the function. The function the model can predict is limited to the, to the vocabulary it used in its training set. And in this case, we had function that can use a variety of operators, but the coefficients in the functions had to be integers. In other words, we had functions, you know, cosine 2x plus 3 or uh, exponential minus two times something, et cetera. But all the coefficients, all the prefactors in the functions learned by the models were integers. In other words, the model doesn't know anything about real numbers, the output model. And so we try to see, can the model still use that to predict the value of a real number? So basically you give the number a sequence, which represents a real number, it could be an arithmetic sequence or a geometric sequence with this value. And you try to see if the model is able to predict this 
sequence or so an approximant to the real number just using integers and operators. So example, you give it 0.33353s, the model is going to output you one third. And the model is right, of course. So it finds a correct approximation to a floating point number by that. If you truncate the result, 0333, the model is going to predict one on three plus exponential minus six. And you see, this makes a lot of mathematical sense. It says it's a little less than one third. Therefore, it's one on three plus a small number. And a small number is an exponential of a negative number, negative integer. Um, even more interesting, suppose you, you give the first decimals of pi. So pi was a symbol in the model training set. So if you give enough decimals, the model will recognize pi and say it's pi. pi. So that's good. But if you truncate, you get that two arctangent expression, which might look a, li a little strange until you think about it, you know, tangent pi, pi divided by two is infinity. So pi is twice the arctangent of a very large number. And so the model has found a formula that sort of makes mathematical sense. There's some kind of, you know, mathematical intuition that appeared. That was clearly not the task of the model. The model was just focused on predicting, predicting a formula from an example, but it sort of, you know, gives nice prediction for, for examples you give. Another, another example, suppose you give the model now data from a function that was not in the vocabulary. So we didn't have the uh, inverse hyperbolic trigonometry in the vocabulary. So the model doesn't know what an, an, an arc hyperbolic sign is. But if you give the values, the model will find you a correct expression of it. And this is the correct expression for those. Uh, even more interesting, if you give the model a function that is absolutely not representable by the the, the functions we gave it as a vocabulary, basically the Liouville functions, um, like Bessel, you will end up with a correct approximation. Uh, in another experiment, we managed to get the Stalling formula out of a sequence of, um, of integrals. We had to, to look for it. It was deep in the beam search. But so the funny thing is that it's, this suggests that the model somehow is learning some kind of mathematical intuition from this. Can I just interrupt again? Just on the previous slide, so on the left-hand side, are you giving these as constant sequences? How, how do you feed a real number into your model? So the thing is that you the, the input are, are real number, and it's a sequence of real number that represent a sequence. So basically, you, you do either the arithmetic or the geometric sequence to do that. And the model is going to, to have to predict to you, you know, you have a very small formula that corresponds to that. So the model sees, that's the, the model that predicts, you know, float uh, formulas on, on real, but it's constrained only to use integer prefactors. So that's, that's the way it is done. So the next one is, you know, I've said number have to encode, the, all the numbers have to be encoded in the model. And in this case, I'm looking at the embedding. So practically when I encode an integer, I encode them in base 1000. In this model, we use base 1000. So we had all tokens from zero to infinity. And these are uh, to, to a thousand, excuse me. And, and the model learns them as, you know, just words. But during training, it learns a representation, a high dimensional representation for these words. They, they are represented as vectors inside the model. And these vectors are learned. So what you see here is a two dimensional projection. It's a PCA basically of the high dimensional representation of integers on the left. And you can see that the small number zero to 10 are the small drop on the on the top left of the of the drawing. So zero is close to one, two, three, four, five to 10. And this is interesting because the model was never told about that, but it sort of learned the, the proximity of numbers. A couple more fun facts. If you look at the top uh, external part of the curve, you will see the square. There's 25, you can probably see 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, 169. Uh, that seemed to be at the outlier. I don't know what this means. You know, this is a projection of some kind of internal representation, but again, something has been learned. On the right, you've got the representation of the floating point exponent. You remember when I encode um, the floating points for the inputs, uh, there are sine mantis exponents. And the exponents go from one minus 100 to 100. I plotted the minus 50 to 50. So 
we'd love to see the squares, but you know, you see 16, 25, but the 36 is not quite at the third one. So it's not, it's not an exact science, maybe projection played a role. But the funny thing is that you see that very nice symmetry around, um, around the first diagonal, which correspond to, you know, the X to one on X mapping. Basically when you turn, change a number into its, its, um, its inverse, then you change the sign of this um, of the exponent. So basically, you're seeing here how the model has sort of internalized basic operations. Yeah. Can I ask a question? So for what there are different kinds of embeddings that one can use. Is it similar for numbers? Like what what is the embedding going to look like? So. You, you get embeddings for everything. The model, you know, takes tokens and learns embedding on the way. So the embedding is the most practical way for the model to learn to, to do the calculation you train it to do. So in general, what happens is that when you have embeddings, you, you will have embeddings for digits, for numbers, for mm -hmm. words, for anything. In language, people have studied embedding, you know, those, are, those examples that show that words similar words tend to be embedded in the same place in the high dimensional embedded embedding. So cat is close to feline, dog is close to canine. And when you have synonyms, they're embedded in the same place. Uh, you, you can even build, you know, relations on embedding. There's that famous example that uh, king minus man plus woman becomes queen. And it's, okay, it's sort of cherry picked and probably approximative, but it's sort of, you know, embedding space conveys a lot of information. That's how translation and supervised translation work. You know, you notice that when you embed a lot of French, a lot of English, a lot of Chinese in different models, and you look at the embeddings, the embeddings look alike. I mean, the, the re relative position of different words of the translation of different words are close or are similar in different embedding. This is how you do unsupervised translation. This is, you know, pretty much all the translation on social networks is done this way because once guess, you've learned the things, you, it's easy yeah. to align them. Yeah. I guess what I was getting at is that is there is is the fact that all the squares are on the border on one picture, but on the other picture there is no such symmetry, but the symmetry is between negative and positive. Is this coming due to the choice of embedding or it's, uh, I think it's due to the, so the, the embeddings are learned by the models. So um, why the squares, the squares appear, I really don't know. Uh, why you have the symmetry for the others, uh, for the, is just the fact that, you know, the div division is a very common application. Multiplication division is a very common thing the model has learned. So the model has learned, you know, an embedding that simplifies, if you like, those calculations make those calculations more obvious. Basically having a good embedding is turning a mathematical operation into, you know, a short distance um, nearest neighbor approach. Um, you could calculate in embedding space. Suppose you embed formulas and numbers, you could probably get an embedding space that calculates. You know, you, you solve a two plus three by looking at the closest integers in embedding space and you find five. I don't know if it would work, but that's that should be the spirit of embedding representation. Uh, Francois, can I interrupt with one question as well? Yeah. So I, I guess whether this question makes sense or not depends on the projection method you're using. But I'm wondering, have you tried retraining your model with a different initialization and doing exactly the same experiment and seeing which structures are So yes, yes this has been done uh, many times. And so the different initialization play a role in the beginning, but in most of those cases, uh, you get the same model after, well, the same model. The, the weights are not the same. There are way too many free parameters for everything to be the same, but you get pretty much the same embeddings. So there might be small differences, but you end up pretty much always with the same embedding, no matter the initialization. Especially here, as this is, you know, this is only the two, dim the, the embedding should be a, a 1024 dimensions. It's a huge space. And we're projecting on the two, two dimension with the highest inertia. So it's, it's really, really compact. You would get the, the same. Uh, yeah, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure we have the same, the same result there. Mm, oh, I was just wondering in particular, say with the floating point exponents, like I guess would expect that, uh, you would see the same diagonal symmetry, but I wonder, would you also see the same pattern of waviness that we haven't yet interpreted? So I this, I don't know. This yeah. this would need to would need to be tested, I think. 
Um, I would expect yes, because the you know it's it's way more than noise. Would it be the exact same thing in the same place? You know, the fact that all, the numbers are really all written in order is it, it's too good to be true. I mean, it cannot happen randomly. Oh yes, I agree. But but rather, you know, there is structure there with the the waviness. But I wonder, you know, is that just a function of the initialization, or is it actually yeah. representing something that we haven't yet interpreted? I guess that's kind of yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. Thank you. So I'd like to present an example from theoretical physics. I'll try to be a bit quick on this one. So it's a it's something we're working on with notably Lance Dixon and Matthias Willem from Niels Bohr Institute and, and Stanford. Uh, basically, they're interested. So they have a problem in theoretical physics, which is very close to math. Um, they're interested in scattering amplitude. So scattering amplitude are the complex function that are used in physics to predict the outcomes of particle collisions. And the way you calculate these amplitudes is by adding Feynman diagrams of increasing loop orders. So it's a sum of approximants, which are the Feynman diagram. A loop in a Feynman diagram is a particle created and destroyed in the process. So you start with a loop zero, the tree level, where you have exactly the particles and nothing is created or destroyed. And then loop one, you have one particle created and destroyed, etc. Each loop gives rise to more complicated calculation. Basically, every time you have a loop, you have two latent variable integration. And these give rise to generalized polylogarithms. So that's that's really difficult to calculate. The best technique they have for the standard model only reach loop two and three. And this is a problem because if you want to interpret you know, the high quality experiments from the, the Large Hadron Collider, loop two, loop three is not enough. So Lance and Matthias did something they call the amplitude bootstrap, which leverage, which says basically polar logarithm are difficult to compute function, but they have a lot of algebraic properties that are very well known. So it's possible to turn this computation into a purely algebraic problem. Don't ask me details on that. I don't understand, but that's that's a general idea. So they can represent every loop on a, as a symbol which is technically an homogeneous polynomial in six non-commutative variables with integer coefficient. Of course, integer coefficient is the interesting part here. So practically a loop, and with this, they could calculate um, one case in a special approximation of the standard model, which is called N equals four super yang mill uh, planar super yang mill theory. They could calculate things to up to loop eight, which is you know, unheard of. So the loops are homogeneous polynomials of degree two L in six non-commutative variables a b a b c d f with integer coefficients, most of them being zero. So, for instance, at loop three, you you could see you could have a loop that goes sixteen a a b d d d, forty eight a a b b f f, etc. 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 And you got a lot of those terms. You see on the right, for loop one, you only have six non-zero terms. For loop eight, you got 1.6 billion terms. So how do you compute those? Well, by leveraging the symmetry, the symmetries of the physical system and as their asymptotic properties, which creates a, a gigantic integer programming system. So they end up solving, you know, tens of thousands of equations in integers to calculate all those elements. But they notice it's full of regularities. So we started saying, OK, could a transformer help uh, calculate, either calculate, better calculate those coefficients, so solve the underlying integer prog programming problem, or maybe learn formulas that could explain you know, why the, the symbols have the shape they have. So last year, we did the first experiment. We say, OK, there are many zeros and non-zeros so basically, you see you have a key, which is a sequence of letters, six letters, and uh, six possible letters and a 2L sequence of that. And some keys are zeros, some are not. And you want to predict it. So we build a 50-50 training sample and train the transformer on it. Just encode the keys, just predict the coefficients. And you test this on 10,000 external terms. And you can see that the model, and you, you measure this, OK? and for loop five, after training on half of the symbol, the model predicts zeros or ones in 99.96% of examples, so very much all the time. In loop six, after 6% 6 only of the symbol, you can predict the rest. So yeah, the model has no difficulty predicting whether a coefficient is zero and one if you shoot enough ex 
example set it. Next step was saying, okay, can you predict now the values, the non-zeros of the coefficient? So same, you have the two L letters and you want to predict integers encoded in B1000 so that the sequence are, are short. And for loop five models, if you train on 60% about the symbol and test it on 100,000 examples, you get 99.9% .9 accuracy. For loop six, you train on 20% of the symbol, test on 100,000, and you get those weird training curves. So what you see, the, the x-axis is the epochs. It's the number of examples the model has seen. The y-axis is the number, the proportion of correctly predicted coefficient. Cor correctly predicted means exactly predicted. Yeah, there's no, you know, you cannot fail by one or two. It's either correct or wrong. And what's interesting you see here is that that two-step curve, which is very uncommon in, in, in when you train, you get that two-step curve that says that the model first quickly learns up to about 50%, and then it takes a long time to reach very close to 100%. The many curves here are different model initialization and model hyperparameters. Okay, so we could predict, but there was that strange curve. And then we looked at it, and the explanation is that it's all due to the sign. So here's the curve. On the left is the magnitude, so the absolute value of the coefficient, and on the right is the sign. And what you see is that the magnitude, the absolute value, is very easy to learn, but the sign only gets learned once all the magnitudes are known. And I don't know you, but this surprised me because, you know, there are so many magnitudes and only two signs. It shouldn't be this way. But we get that and we came back to the physicists and they say, oh yeah, that's an interesting finding. And now they're working on, you know, why the magnitude works this way and the sign was this way. So we haven't solved anything, but I think we raised the interesting question for the physicists at this point. Yeah. So... The takeaway is that, okay, you can complete loops with that. You learn the coefficients with very high accuracy, but you have a couple of unintuitive operations, like the difficulty of learning the sign. The fact that the sign is plays a role here. So the next idea was say, okay, can you predict the next loop? You have one symbol, you want to predict the next loop. So you remember all terms in the loop are symbols of two L letters. So if you want to predict it and think of a recurrence relation, well, maybe a generalized recurrence, you could say that there's a way to go from a L, loop L coefficient with two L letters to a loop L minus one letters, which is two L minus two, uh, by striking out two letters. And there's exactly uh, L times two L minus one parents, you know, ways to strike out. So we say, okay, suppose we give the, we give the, L times two L minus one parents, just the coefficients because we know we can predict from the from the key. So let's just send the coefficient to the machine. Can it predict the, the parent coefficient, the, the coefficient of the next loop? And fine, you know, you can think of it as a very generalized Pascal triangle or pyramid. It's not exactly a pyramid because it's not commutative, but it's, you know, it's more complicated expression that represents some kind of a generalized recurrence. So if you predict from loop six, Loop six from loop five, you have 66 parents and you're predicting one. So 66 loop five coefficient and you're predicting one loop six. And you end up with 98% accuracy. So yes, there's a formula. We don't know what it is, but there seems to be a formula which is simple enough for the model to find it relatively easy. It makes a little difference. So sign is a little harder to predict than accuracy, but not much. So it's not as before. So there's a function. We don't know which one it is. So at this point, we could try to open the model and look at the weights, but good luck with that. It's there are so many weights, it's very difficult to do. So we tried to understand what the recurrence could say. So we said, okay, what happens if we remove some information? So could we use less parents? Right now I said, you know, I got my letters and I strike two and there are 66 ways to strike out two letters out of 12. But I could decide that when I strike two letters, I strike only letters that are close together. So letters that are one letter away, two letters away. Okay. And, and so this is the, the value of K. And you can see that if instead of striking all the next letters, you strike letters that are only close, you don't lose, lose anything. The model learns just as well. So we're saying that, you know, the, the function that the model is learning is probably simpler than a very generalized 
recurrence with 66 elements, it's, it, it works with only 20 parents. There are only 20 active variables. Or there's a version of this recurrence with only 20 active variables. We also showed that if you change the order of parents, so if you shuffle them randomly, you lose some accuracy, but not much. So you would be in a function that is somehow, it's not exactly commutative, but you can you can permute all the variable and you get the same value. You know, you would get that for addition, for instance. Um, you can see that the signs, if you only provide the sign, you learn the sign correctly, but you lose a little on the magnitudes. If you give only the magnitudes and not the sign, you're going to suffer badly on the signs, which is something we noticed. So altogether, what we're saying is, so the work is, is going on right now. We're trying to build loop nine. We're trying to do all that. But what I'm saying is that I think it's a good way to look at you know, how transformers can help do research as a way to do experiment that suggests properties, experimental properties that can then be tested or, or can then help scientists work. Yeah. OK, so now I want to show a different approach to this which is how you can do uh, how you can do math to better understand transformers so I'll present other reasons so there are a couple of questions you know seen by that you can see that you can train transformer to solve very interesting and important problems but the question is do they really learn the mathematic or are they just learning shortcuts are they parroting statistical patterns you know as a famous paper said recently also, are the failure predictable? If you want to use that in science, you absolutely want the, the model to, to fail in a nice and predictable way. You don't want the model to confabulate, to fail at random. Also, there's a question of explainability. We've seen that with the gluons, uh, with the physics. You know, Is it only black box and you cannot say anything, or can you explain what the model is, is doing? And finally, there's a question which is more on M ML size. We generate data. What's the impact of generating data? You know, does it impact the results and, and what can we do about it? So I'd like to show the very end of a paper uh, from last year, which was about doing linear algebra with transformers. So basically you put matrices and you want the transformer to calculate, to predict properties of the matrices. And the transformer can learn to add, to transpose, can to, to multiply matrices, relatively large matrices, uh, with almost 100% accuracy. More interestingly, it can also calculate um, you know, more complex functions of matrices like eigenvalues or eigen decomposition, or it could invert a matrix. So yeah, this was surprising, but I I'd like to show something more interesting there. So suppose I train a transformer to diagonalize, so to calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a symmetric real matrix. So I'm giving the model a symmetric matrix M, and I want the model to predict a vector and a matrix that verify, you know, such that the transpose, uh, the multiply by the matrix by the transpose, et cetera, gives a diagonal. And the model will only learn that from examples. So it sees pairs of M and DH, uh, diagonal and value. So it only sees integers. But we know uh, from, you know, theory, from the spectral theorem, that D are essentially unique, unique up to a permutation. That's the eigenvalues. And the H will be unitary, in this case, orthogonal. So the rows and column will be orthogonal and have unit norms. So the question for the transformer is that, suppose I train a transformer. Is the transformer, is, will the transformer learn that these are the eigenvalues and that H is unitary? And what does it even mean, you know, learning that for a machine, for a transformer that just translates language? So the way to test that is that suppose I train my model to high accuracy, 92% accuracy. The fact that I'm not at 100 accuracy is very important. You need to fail in order to do that. So the model achieves 92% accuracy and I'm testing it on 100,000 matrices. So I end up with 92,000 correct prediction. Correct meaning eigenvalues and eigenvectors are learned up to a very low tolerance and 8,000 errors. Now, if I look at the errors and even the good correct predictions, I can see that in every test case but six, the out of 100,000, the eigenvalues are predicted with less than 1% error. And in 99% almost of the test case, the rows and columns of H have unit norms. In other words, the two properties of diagonalization are respected by model prediction, even when the, the model fails to find the correct formula. And I'm saying this is... Um, 
a strong intuition that the model has learned those properties. You know, you imagine a student that fails solving a problem, but some parts of the problem are always solved correctly. Uh, those parts you say, okay, these properties are learned or these things are learned. This is exactly the same thing here. <clears throat> so some math seems to have been learned in this case. It goes further actually, because if instead of, you know, you could think that the model will learn that in the end after training 92%, but even if you train the model to less accuracy, you know, train it for to 70% accuracy, just a few epochs, you still get the correct eigenvalues, you still get the unit norms in, in rows and columns. If you work on larger matrices, my models are too small for 6-6 six, six matrices. Everything was on 5-5 five, five matrices, 6-6 six, six matrices, and we need to, to get larger models. But I keep with the small models. In that case, my model only achieved 43% accuracy, so much less good. Still, the eigenvalues are correct, etc. So it's interesting because it's 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 a nice counter counterpart on you know that discussion about hallucination. The model invents crazy thing. In that case, the model doesn't hallucinate. When the model is wrong, it's wrong in a correct mathematical way, in the sense that okay, it missed the orthogonality of the eigenvalue, which is a the harder problem, but the rest is correct. So it's not crazily wrong. It's not absurdly wrong. And this is interesting because it shows that I can trace all model failures to one single cause, which is the rows of column of H not being quite orthogonal. No. So in reality, they're close to orthogonal, but not, you know, there's two or three of them that are a bit skewed or something like that. It's interesting because you can even predict error. So in that case, you know, if you look at the condition uh, number of the, the predicted matrix, should be one if it's orthogonal. You can see that you can predict model failures just by looking at that. So the model failures are extremely simple and principled. You get the same result for matrix inversion, where you can show that all model failures, about 10% failures there, come from the fact that the input matrix is badly conditioned. And this is the only cause of failure. So the model fails exactly the way, the same way as we or you know, a mathematical calculator, an approximate calculator would do. It's almost impossible to invert matrices that are badly conditioned. Uh, last thing I wanted to show here was, you know, when you compute eigenvalues, as I said, I'm learning, so I, I'm looking at a different case. I'm only computing eigenvalue here. All the models, so my models have been trained on symmetric matrices with independent coefficients. So I randomly sample my, co my coefficients so that they're two by two independent and have the same span, the same number of the same uh, uh, intervals in uh, on the real. So those matrices are known as Vigno matrices and they have very strong properties as random matrices. They have very strong properties of their eigenvalues, which is the eigenvalues are distributed as a semicircle. They're symmetric around zero. There's all, almost the same number of positive and negative eigenvalues. The variance is constrained, the support is bounded, and, and convergence to, to semicircle is very fast. The question is, when I say my model has learned eigenvalues, has it learned the eigenvalues of matrices or just the eigenvalues of Wigner matrices? So do we generalize to other cases? So to do this, I generated matrices with different distribution of eigenvalues. So Wigner, the first line, semicircle. So lines are the training set and columns are the test sets here. But then eigenvalue that would be you know, uniform or Gaussian or Laplace. So there are still uh, eigenvalues of uh, positive and negative, et cetera. And then three sets of strictly positive, uh, ma positive definite matrices. So either absolute values, you know, of the summit of Wigner or Laplace or Marchenko Pasteur, which is the closest approximation we have of a you know, statistical matrix, a covariance matrix. And you can see that if you train, so the first line, if you train on a semicircle on Wigner matrices, you can predict the eigenvalues of Wigner matrices with 100% success. So it works. If you go to different distribution of eigenvalues, uniform Gaussian Laplace, but still symmetric, you're down to 30% of correct prediction. So it doesn't work very well. And the model cannot predict uh, eigenvalues of definite positive matrices. Samely, three last lines. If you look at definite positive matrices at train time, it will not be able to predict the eigenvalues. You know, it will never have seen a negative eigenvalue, so there's no way it will invent one.
But the funny things are lines two and three, where you see that if you train on Gaussian and Laplace distributed eigenvalues, which are not positive definite, you know, the probability of such a matrix being definite positive is very, very low. You can see that the model generalized to all test sets. So what this suggests is that, yes, in general, you don't generalize well out of the training distribution. But this is by no means, you know, fatality. This is by no means something you're, you're bound to, that is bound to happen. There seem to be kind of magical distributions where the model learns better. And I don't know why, but this, this would be probably something very interesting to study. Uh, by the way, those distributions have another funny pro property is that when you train on the distribution, they learn much faster, even out of distribution. So if you train on very large matrices, on a very small sample of matrices, on a very small training sample, you don't have enough data to learn, you know, even Vigno matrices in distribution. But with those distribution, you can learn, you know, any distribution. So they're more efficient. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that the underlying math I sometimes learned, there's a possibility to get out of distribution generalization, and there are kind of robust distribution that can exist for some of the problems. So the GCD is a very recent result. The, the paper was, well, the paper is in the review actually. So the idea is, okay, could a model learn greatest common divisor? So it starts from a very simple operation. If I give four integers to my model, A, B, C, D, it's very easy to train a model to tell whether the fraction A on B is larger or smaller than C on D. So it's very easy to train, you know, you need a hundred thousand examples of A, B, C, D between Z, one and a million, and the model will tell you, oh yeah, this fraction is larger, this fraction is smaller. If you try do the same thing and try to produce a sum or a product of fraction simplifies to lowest term, it never works. And I tried huge models on that. It, I never could make it work. Even giving just one fraction and trying to simplify it, it doesn't work. So the question was, okay, is the GCD the problem? Because you see, you don't need the GCD to compare, but you need the GCD to sum and multiply or simplify. So, you know, it's always the same thing. I generate random pairs of integers between one and a million. I compute the GCD and train the model and test on a hundred thousand examples. It's a huge problem space. You've got 10 to the 12 examples. So the model will not be able to memorize everything. There are just too many examples. And the first examples, the first experiments I did with it suggest, oh yes, yes, it works. You see, I'm encoding input and output in base 30. So why 30? It's a very composite numbers. And the intuition is that if you have a large space, you have shorter sequence. And if you have many divisors, divisibility is easier to judge in base 30 or 60 or 12 than in base 31, say. So one layer transformer 64 dimension, this is beyond ridiculous. You know, it's, it's very, very small models. And you end up with 95% accuracy after a couple of examples, a few million, tens of millions of examples. So it seems to work. Until you look at base 31, the green curve is base 31, and then it doesn't work. You still get 61% accuracy, but only 61 and it doesn't learn. And if you try on many different bases, encoding base, so that's the base for encoding the GCD, you get, you know, from top to bottom, 36, 10, 2, 3, 31. And the G GCD looks like it is base dependent. And this is, this is absurd. I mean, the GCD is not base dependent. We know that. But the transformer is clearly not learning the right thing. So what's happening? You can look at the prediction. So these are the model prediction in base 2 and base 10. And... The first thing I notice is that if I give two pairs, A, B, and C, D, to the machine with the same GCD, the model is going to always predict, that's the 100% or 99.9% you see here, to predict the same thing. It might be right, it might be wrong, but the model is able very early in training to tell that A, B, and C, D have the same GCD or not. We cannot do that, but the machine learns that very quick. And in base two, you can see the model predictions for the different GCD, so different output GCD. Uh, and the bold are the, the values the model predicts. So you can see the correct predictions are 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Rings a bell, right? More So the model predicts the powers of two. More interestingly, all the odd numbers are predicted as one. And the even numbers are predicted as the largest power of two that divides both numbers. Basically, what the model is doing, it's counting the zeros, you know, the rightmost zeros in the binary representation. If you have two, 
the model is divisible, the number is divisible by four. So if you compute the zeros on the two inputs and take the minimum and predict two to this, to this minimum, you get a prediction which accounts for all the model predictions. For base 10, it's a little more complicated, but it's the same. You basically can predict the GCD for all values from that are product of divisors of the base. Okay, in fact, you can explain all model prediction for all bases by three rules. So you have a unique value. If you have a pair of integers with GCDK, the model always predicts a function f of k, which is k when the model is right and different when it's not. The correct predictions are products of primes dividing b. Okay. And f of k is the largest correct prediction that divides k. And this always works. So at this point, I got, you know, I don't have a success because I can see that the model doesn't predict all the GCD. But I can explain every model prediction by looking at the model prediction. And you can get, you know, if you go to 420, so that's 4 times 3 times 5 times 7. So it's, it's really engineered you get up to 30, you, you can predict 96.8% of all GCD because you know small GCD are more common than large GCD. Uh, but you can only predict 38 correct GCD out of the first 100. Okay, what's interesting is that if you take the model and leave it cooking for a long time, so if you leave the model training, you know, after 100 epochs, the model has learned, or 10 epochs, the model has learned everything it could learn. You, you leave it trained. For large base, you notice that after a while, things change. The model starts to learn non-divisors. And this is called grokking from a previous paper um, that observed that in modular, modular arithmetic. So for instance, here I have three curves with different initialization for base 2023, which is seven times 17 to the square. After 10 epoch, very naturally, one, seven, and 17 are correctly learned. That's my previous results. And then nothing happens. You see the loss curve, it's totally flat. But suddenly around epoch 100 or sometime later, it depends on the initialization, the model learns division by three. And then three and 21 and 51 are correctly predicted. And this is not a divisor of the base. You cannot do that you know, by a trick by looking at the last digits. The model has really learned that. And it's strange, and this is why we call it grokking, because you know the loss is flat, and the loss is the signal that the model used to learn. So if the loss is flat, the model has no signal, yet it learns something new. And then you wait for another 100 epochs. So 100 epoch is 300,000 examples. So 100 epoch is 30 million examples. So it's a lot of examples. And all of a sudden, the model learns two and all the multiples. So two, six, 14. So the products by two of all the previous correct predictions. And at epoch 600, you learn four and so on. So you see something interesting is happening here, uh, which is the model after a long time starts to learn small primes and powers of small primes, not dividing the base roughly in order. So, but the, my, the system is still up to this. The system is still very interpretable. The predictions can be interpreted the, exactly the same way as before. Okay, and you see when you do this on many different base, you learn the divisors and you learn on the right a couple of non-divisors of the base. So the next step was about the training distribution. Remember with the matrices, I got those special distributions. And the intuition here is that, you know, so far I, I used uniformly distributed operands, which, and between one and a million for my GCD. Of course, if I train on this, it means 90% of the example the model sees are larger than 100,000. And small GCD, like GCD 6 and 9, are never seen. And this is just not the way we learn arithmetic. This is not the way we teach it. You know, We teach small examples to generalize to large ones. So what if we did the same thing? So to do this, I work on log uniform operands. So basically, k appears with probability 1 on k. So basically, you sample them according to their logarithm and round it. Um, so in this case, you have as many one digit number as six digit number, and you're telling the model, okay, be my guess, memorize the small examples. You got so many of them, and I'll give you less hard examples, but you'll manage. And you see, we still get the shape curve, the, the step curves 
as before, and it's a bit, it's way more noisy in that case. But instead of predicting like 30 or 40 different GCD, you now predict up to 70. So the model learns way better in this way. You can do even more. So in that case, you can see the base, you end up with like 70, but even with, you know, 10 or well, 10, I could predict 15 GCD before. Now I can predict 48 different GCDs between one and 100. So the model just learns faster with that. If instead of just training on log uniform input, you also uh, uniformize the, the distribution of, of outcomes, so the distribution of GCD, then you can even improve that. So by what I'm saying that by engineering the training distribution, you can end up predicting almost all the GCD that exist that between one and one and 100, right? The last thing, which is more a question than a thing, is that then you might say, okay, let's have uniform outcomes. Let's have as many ones and two and three and that in the GCDs. So let's sample the GCD so that you have the same number of small and large GCD because in nature, it's not the way. You have more small GCD than large GCD. Um, the thing is that everything breaks in that case. <laughs> so you need, uh, you know, obvious distribution. That's the point with Vigna matrices. That's the same here. Obvious distribution, like having balanced outcomes can result in problems, can, can make things more complicated. And I'm sort of studying this now. Uh, yeah, so the main thing that are interesting with the GCD experiments is that the predictions are deterministic and explainable. I can, you know, make up rules, simple rules that explain pretty much everything the model is doing with very, very high accuracy. Uh, we can also discover what the model is do learning. The model basically, it's not using Euclid, that's very clear. It's sort of learning a sieve. It's, it classify input pairs into clusters with common divisors and attribute the smallest value, the, the, the smallest va value of the, the groups in the pair, which happens to be the largest divisor of those pairs. So that's how the GCD is learned. And eventually, if you let the model run for enough time, it will learn all GCD this way. So this is a, this is a correct algorithm. It's, it's just a bit inefficient. So yeah, that's that's pretty much. I'm sorry for the for the extension. That's pretty much all I had to say. But um, the main takeaway is that it's quite possible for transformers to train transformers to do math. It's a really a new field that, uh, of research. But what's interesting is that we notice that the machine is sort of building mathematical intuition on the way, or something that we would like to qualify as intuition. If it was displayed by humans, we would say it is intuition. I think. And, and this is interesting because it teaches us something about ML and about math, probably. Thank you very much. Questions? Okay, she asks, how much hallucination do you observe in general in your experiments? How much hallucination? So the, the point is that when the model is trained and is trained, so I always train supervisedly. And in supervised learning, I almost never observe hallucination. To give you an example, when you train on, on symbolic sequences, so when you train on sequence representing functions, of course, there's lots of sequence of tokens that mean nothing, like plus, 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 cos, cos, plus. It's not, these sequence disappear um, very early in training. The model never predict those sequences. So there's no hallucination in the sense as that the, the model doesn't predict something totally crazy um, early in training. My feeling is that this is mostly due to supervision. So most large language models are trained in an unsupervised way, you know, with mass processing. And when you're when you're doing mass processing, you know, you don't have an argument of truth. You don't have a measure of truth. The only thing you have is plausibility. How often does it happen in a training set? When you do supervised training, you have a notion of truth somewhere in the model, which is, you know, the the, the examples, the, the solution that you give to the model. And, and so I suspect this is the main reason. So practically, I don't have, you know, the crazy things that look like hallucinations. How do you actually, like you said, I, I can very much tell what the transformer, how it's learning. How do you visualize that? Like how the machine is learning? How do you do that? Like tuition? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So that's that's 
you know, there's a whole branch called explainability. So the way I'm I'm trying to vis to say what the model is saying is by looking at its production uh, at its uh, prediction, and sometime uh, even engineering the test set. So engineering examples and seeing what the model predicts. Um, the GCD is a good case. You know, the GCD I started with, you know, random numbers, etc., and then I had the test sets, which is has the same number of GCD one, two, three, four, five, and I look at the prediction and, and do statistics. So, in the case of mathematics, you can usually control the the problem and design as many you know tests exactly like you would test a student uh, to to determine because you have the underlying theory. When you're doing language or natural language, it's much, way more difficult because the, the number of things, the problems like that, that you can build in language is, is, is limited. So people try to interpret the weights. So they try to open the transformer and maybe look. So you can look at the, um, you can look at the embedding, you know, what you've seen with the integers and, and say that numbers are represented in close place or different place, which probably means something, but it's, it, it's never, you know, decisive. Some people have tried to model the transformers as circuits, so trying to design kind of a logical circuit that the transformer would implement. But this is always, you know, relatively approximative. So it's in the GCD case, it's, uh, I, I'm trying to make a case for this actually, is to, the idea that in math, you can probably much better decide or understand what the model is doing. The best comparison I can find, you know, is what people who do who try to do responsibly, I do do with, with language, you know, when they, uh, I've seen, there's a lot of, of examples of the, of how mo how models care about gender or translate gender from one language to another. Yeah. So you have language where you have, you know, say French, French is very rich in masculine and feminine. Everything is gendered in French. English is much less gendered and you have language, Chinese, for instance, which is absolutely ungendered. So it's interesting because you can, you can leverage that, but it's always an indirect, indirect way of, of, of studying things. So you can build special cases, but you will be limited to, um, you know, you cannot, for instance, you wouldn't be able to modify the training distribution or, or do it well on language. You can do that on math. So, so yeah, the, the way I try to understand is by looking at the, at the prediction, basically. And do you always like look at all the uh, weights because there are so many, or do you always look at the projected the projections? Like, so I try to avoid looking at the weights. So I, I, I try to display, you know, the attention mechanism or the weights or the embedding because, well, you know, when you write a paper, they make so, such nice drawings, and and reviewers are crazy about it, and they will always ask about it. The the problem is that. You know, for instance, when we did symbolic regression, we noticed that when you give some functions, the model predicts the attention mechanism really look like the kind of all style Fourier transform things you would see on oscilloscopes or stuff like that. It's you had you really had the impression that something so the illustration was nice. But then as soon as you wanted to interpret this as what the model is doing, um there was very little, you know, it's like the squares in the in the graph. You see that the square are in special places in in the, the embedding, but what does it mean? It's it's impossible to interpret. So I try to avoid looking too much at the weight because it's um the only success that had been had at the weight was for very, very, very small transformers. So like one layer, one head. In that case, you can compute and try to to determine. So it's known that models, not just transformers, but all the model sort of do some kind of Fourier transform on, on their parameters. So they're working in a Fourier base. That's that seems relatively clear. But apart from that, it's it's really a thankless task. Thanks, thanks so much. I have one more question. I guess with the GCD case, you know, the ideal result would be if it learned Euclid. Do you, do you expect that your current architecture could learn Euclid? Or I guess it's, you kind of want to be able to learn a sort of iterative function. Do you think there's other architectures that could learn something like that? So, yes, yes. Well, in the, in the GCD case, you can see that if you engineer the training distribution enough, you can probably achieve 99 to 100% of the GCD, and probably you can do all the rational arithmetic with the transformer. So... 
one takeaway is that there's no hard limitation on whether a transformer can do this or not. When you have more iterative function, there has been experiment on something called universal transformer, which are transformer which instead of having several layers of different weight, you have just one layer that you loop through. So basically the output of one loop is the input, uh, the output of one, one layer, of the layer goes back into the input a number of time. And some people have shown that, so for transformer, but for other architecture as well, is that those models can learn recursive patterns and you can use even use them you know, in a way that if you train them on problem of a certain size, but then at inference, you run them for more loops than you use that training, then the model is able to generalize to longer, to larger model, to larger problems. So it seems there are ways to do this, keeping with the transformer architecture, keeping with um, the attention mechanism and all that. Uh, it seemed that there are ways to generalize to more complex problems. This is an under under research problem, so it's there's a lot of work to be done on this. But there seems to be hope that machines that transformers can do that. As for the transformer versus other architectures, right now pretty much everything is transformers. So the GCD I experimented at, at the demand of a reviewer. I experimented with a um, previous architecture, so LSTM, GRU, and I can get the same result with LSTM. So it's not specific to the transformer. It's uh, you need a, a sequential model, but other models would work. The ID people right now like to use the transformer a lot because transformer seems to be very versatile. They, they can learn all kind of. So if you have enough data, they can pretty much learn any inductive bias in any specificity of your data. Whereas if you have, you know, CNN or GNN or other architecture, they tend to be tailor, tailor made for, you know, one kind of inductive bias on the data. So that's um yeah that that's but it, it seems yeah, like yeah with a mixture of you know distribution different distribution and loops possibly loops on the weights you can probably do a lot better than what we're doing now with transformers i think you know, can i maybe have another go at your question <laughs> sure. yeah what would it be like if um your model also had some scratch space like, you know, the analog of a piece of paper where it can, you know, do a bit of working along the way where it could perform an iterative algorithm for finally outputting. Uh, so uh, I think this would be very interesting. Uh, I, I didn't want to do that in the GCD because I, I didn't, you know, if you if you start doing chain of thought or scratch pad, you've got to tell the algorithm, the algorithm, uh, the, the model, the algorithm you want. And then you, you won't know the algorithm the machine learns because you, you've, mm, you've told yeah. it already. But um, I suspect the, the planning thing. So I, I suspect it works. It doesn't work in obvious ways. You know, a couple of years ago with Amori Ayat, we worked on differential systems. So basically that was a spectral mapping theorem. So, you know, getting the, the stability of a differential systems by looking at the eigenvalues of the Jacobian. But the model was doing everything end to end. So it was computing the Jacobian, cal evaluating it, then calculating the eigenvalue, then predicting. So we did something like this. We said, since the Jacobian values are necessary, what happens if we add the Jacobian values to the input? So we provide a hint to the model, which say, okay, here's the system, here's the Jacobian, now predict. And it turned out that it didn't help. So, you know, the model, the problem was that if you add the Jacobian, you've got a much longer sequence. So it's more difficult to understand from example only, but you have more information in the sequence, which should help the model. But in that specific case, the two sort of evened out. I would think that, that there's probably better ways to do this, you know, to have iterative methods. Some people have tried to do this for proving, for instance, you know, all the people who did MCTS-based, so tree-based proving. So they basically use RL to explore kind of a tree of possible elements of proof or tactics for proving. Uh, but they use a transformer as what they call a critic. So a transformer that would say, okay, the, the best move would be this one. So if you think, you know, if you think of it as chess or something like that, you would have a transformer that was trained to evaluate a position and guess and order the best move. And you would use that as a rationale to explore the tree. And they obtained some success, but it was not as successful as they expected. So yes, I think, yes, this is definitely a direction to be followed. It's not obviously, um, it, it won't work very easily. It's, um, th there's a lot of trade-offs there, I mean. 
And just a quick, quick thing. Why didn't you try actually uh, to increasing the layers when, uh, why did you only work with one layer for the GCD, like when it was not learning? Did you experiment? Oh, actually, no, no, the first, the first example was one layer, but actually in the GCD, all the models have four layers. Uh, I actually tried to get up to 12 layers uh, as far as my GPU could do. So up to a billion parameters. So those models are like a hundred million or some small by transformer reconning. I went up to a billion and there's very little to gain, at least on the GCD problem with much larger models. So the, the scaling doesn't seem to help on this single one, but it was four layers. I was wondering how you think about training volume. Like, you know, the volumes of training data that you have here are kind of beyond my wildest. But how do you decide between like a you know, 500,000 training set or a 40 million examples? Or like, how do you think about how much volume you're going to need? So in general, since my data is generated, in general, I try to have as large a sample as I can. So I usually settle for something between 10 and 100 million examples. Um, the only case where I needed to think about it was the physics case, because there, you know, the number of examples is constrained because that's all the examples there are in the symbol. And so I was in the big, at first, you know, the small loops, you have 300,000 or 500 or maybe a million or a few millions. And there's a dihedral symmetry at work here. So actually all the symbols are duplicated sixfold um, with a very obvious symmetry that the model will definitely learn. Um, so those were small samples, and I was surprised to see that the transformers could learn um, despite this. So in general, you need you still need a lot of examples, uh, but the model can learn. Uh, the unintuitive thing in the in the physics was that I noticed that you know if you have not enough samples, the best way to avoid the model from overfitting is to use a larger model, not a smaller one. Which is, you know, it's an intuitive because you would say, oh, it overfits because it has too many parameters. It's not the way the, the model works. If you have a larger model, it has more slack and it's able to put different information in different places and the overfitting will, it will end up happening if you have too small a training sample, but it works this way. Right now, my approach to, to sampling would be more trying to have you know, more data generated, even maybe from different problems and sort of a pre-training thing. So generate even more data to better train the model instead of trying to constrain the number of training data you want on the model. The, the thing with transformers is that since they need to learn all the inductive bias from scratch, you the only way to do it is data. So I know some people have tried to, you know, engineer the initialization and all that to, to do this, but seems seems a bit weird to me. I mean, if you want to train the inductive bias, you generate the data and, and you train it on, on this. This is more in you know, the spirit of the transformer, if you will. Thanks a lot. So, Francois, you had many kind words in the chat. 